Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Carolina Weather Group. This is the Wednesday, January 9th, 2019 edition of our little weather get-together. Happy New Year. Thank you uh, for joining us over the past couple of weeks, watching some of our uh, pre-recorded shows and our year in review. We hope you enjoyed that. We're happy to be back for uh, the 2019 year, and we are starting it off with a bang tonight. We have Pat Warner. He is the Director of Public Relations at Waffle House. We're going to be talking about the Waffle House Storm Index. Uh, this really became a, a storm here in the Carolinas as uh, Hurricane Florence moved ashore on the North Carolina coast. So you probably remember hearing about that. We're going to go in-depth tonight and talk about the uh, Waffle House Index and how Waffle House prepares uh, for major uh, disasters like this. So we'd love for you to interact with us tonight. You can do that one of many different ways. You can uh, follow us on Facebook Live or our Periscope. All you have to do is drop a question or a comment in the uh, comment section. We will monitor those throughout the show. And if you're watching on our Facebook, uh, I mean, I'm sorry, on our YouTube page, you also uh, can drop any questions there. And if you're listening on the podcast version, we will, um, in the show where uh, you can find some information and uh, get some contact info if you maybe have a question about uh, what we discussed tonight. So uh, this is show number 260, and we're happy to have uh, Pat Warner on with you. Let me do a little introduction here before we get into the show tonight. Um, after a major disaster, first responders rush in to help. But after the rescues, those who remain need food. That's where restaurants like the Waffle House comes in. Famous for their 24-hour breakfast food, the Southern Chain is also known for keeping its grills on, even when the rest of the town is in the dark. In 2011, the federal government introduced the world to the Waffle House test, also known as the Waffle House Index. FEMA began to use the simple test to determine how quickly a community might be able to get up and running again after the disaster, hence the Waffle House test. So here's how it works. The government tracks which restaurants are open, which are closed, and which are running with a limited menu. Uh, they even go as far as to map them. This act is also a formal method to measure a storm's impacts in its community in the communities. Uh, this happened here in the Carolinas during Hurricane Florence. Tweets from reporters along the Carolina coast captured the lifeline uh, provided by Waffle House and the severity of the storm as the few restaurants were forced to close, a rarity for the chain. So how does this all work and how does the company do it? I would like for you to welcome to the Carolina Weather Group, Waffle House Director of Public Relations and External Affairs, Pat Warner. Welcome, Pat, to the show. We're happy to have you. And, uh, Pat, we were talking before the show, you're fresh off a trip to uh, Panama City where uh, you were just down there monitoring the uh, recovery acts from uh, Hurricane Michael. That's right. I just got back a little while ago. Thanks for having me on the show and I appreciate uh, hanging out with you all tonight and, and talking a little bit about the Waffle House Index. Yeah, you're right. We're down in Panama City. Uh, for a few days, kind of checking in on the recovery efforts down there. It's still uh, still pretty tough down there. Uh, a lot of the damage in into the city. A lot of trees are still down. A lot of folks still don't, don't have a place to live, and that, that's what we're finding with our folks down there. So uh, I was down there for about three days and, and just got back, and back here in Georgia and all the air with you guys. Yeah, we were looking forward to uh, hearing about the Waffle House in, uh, Index and how you guys prepare for the storms. And uh, we definitely want to get into uh, maybe some of the stories that you've been able to uh, to uh, uh, remember from uh, previous hurricanes. But before we do that, it's kind of a generic question we ask all of our first-time guests is, how? what's your career path? How did you uh, get to what you're doing right now at the Waffle House? Uh not too exciting of a story. My wife and I moved to Atlanta, and uh, Waffle House was uh, fortunate, or, or however you want to think about it. Uh, they hired me about 20 years ago uh, to come into the communications department, and I've, I've been there ever since. Uh, uh, before that, we lived up in Kentucky, and I, I, I did some uh, TV up there, uh, sports and programming and production, and that's where my wife and I met. But like I said, we, we moved, moved down to Atlanta in 1999, and I was fortunate to land at Waffle House. I always do it every show. Forget to unmute my mic. We uh, we always talk about, you know, you, we were talking before the show, you really didn't have the weather bug, but since being in this position, uh, you've been able to uh, follow the weather a lot clo uh, more closely. Yeah, right. Yeah, like we were talking about, I was, I was a sportscaster, so we used to make fun of the weather guys because uh, they had the easiest job in the world in television. They come in late, they watch the weather channel, rip some stuff off the wire, go on and, you know, point. Uh, but, yeah, when I got to Waffle House, I realized uh, – it affects so much of our business that we're always monitoring the weather. We're always looking at forecasts. We actually have some resources 
within the company that sends out reports to the, the entire company forecasting what it's going to be for the week, what it's going to be for the weekend. Because uh, really, uh, no, no matter what the weather is, it really impacts how many people come through the door, uh, whether it's a hurricane or just a afternoon shower. Uh, and in Atlanta, if it's an afternoon shower, then you're going to have uh, horrendous traffic. Uh, so each market is really monitoring that weather, and, and it really impacts how, how we perform each day. Yeah, and that, that's something we wanted to talk to you uh, to you about, Pat. How do you guys monitor the weather? You were talking about maybe from your average everyday summer afternoon to maybe a bigger snowstorm or a hurricane moving into the area. So how do you guys do it? Uh, what resources do you guys use? And is it a team effort or is it maybe just one or two of you guys? Uh, explain how that process goes. Well, really, I... Uh... Pretty much everyone in management that runs the restaurants, we call that our operations team. Uh, they're monitoring the weather, you know, nowadays with the apps. Uh, they're, they're monitoring their local weather. They're, they're monitoring the national weather. Here at the office back here at the, our headquarters are in Norcross, Georgia. We, we monitor for the whole system. And we have uh, it, it, we, we have a, a gentleman by, by the name of Matt Stark, and he, uh, he helps us put together what's going on out there in the weather. That's not his full-time job. He's actually in our purchasing department. And he's he's dealing with uh, coffee future forecasts and things like that during the day. And then we say his night job is he's doing the weather forecast for us. So he 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 kind of keeps us all abreast and, and gives us the early warning if there is a storm. Uh, when it comes to hurricane season, he is really monitoring it. And, and we start monitoring the storms even before they're a, a tropical depression, just because we have to uh, see how they are developed, where they're going, so we can have our all of our resources and the time needed to get our resources together to respond. So tell us about, you know, what is uh, what is it like, you know, in, in the Waffle House Storm Center? You know, when I first saw that tweet come out, we were like, oh, my God, that that, that is the best job of meteorology. Um, so so what is what is that like? What kind of personnel is in there and, and, and how does that get spun up? Is that something you have all the time or is that just for events? No, we, we activate when there's a, a major storm or a major event. Uh, and so the, the Storm Center for us. It's really a conference room, and we just bring in some uh, extra technology and equipment, mainly so we can all get around the table, and it, it, it's the easy communication. Like I said, we all have day jobs, and then when we activate on the storm team, we all have uh, additional jobs. We have one gentleman that's kind of runs the storm center, and and really for us, it is uh, we we call it a storm center, not a command center, because our leadership's in the field. Our uh, Executive vice presidents are in the field already, so they're the ones really calling the shots when the storm. Our CEO will be on the ground. Our chairman was at both hurricanes this year, so our leadership's in the field, and we're more back in the office, giving them more of the situational awareness of what's going on, uh, and and helping them with what resources they need. So we kind of marshal those resources. So that's really what's going on in that room. So we have uh, obviously uh, uh, Will Mizell is the guy who heads it up. He's kind of our quarterback. We have a couple of folks in there from our purchasing team. Uh, they're the ones that are working with our suppliers to get the food in. Uh, we have typically one or two dedicated resources on uh, lodging because we're going to bring in a lot of folks and we got to put them up somewhere. And so they're, they're dealing with the lodging. We'll have uh, somebody from our social media is in there because they're monitoring the storm through social media and also feeding out information. We also have folks in there from our construction team and uh, from what we call our people team. Uh, and they, they kind of, the people team handle the, uh, you know, after the storm, what are the needs of our associates down there? Do we need to put them up? Do we need to bring in uh, supplies for them? Uh, and so all that's around that table and we're all kind of there uh, for the duration of the storm. And, and it's mainly there to support the folks out in the field because they're the ones really doing the heavy lifting. Uh, in different roles through the, uh, my years at the company, I have been on some of the jump teams uh, and been going to the hurricanes. My role now, I'm, I'm more back at the storm center. Uh, I, I say it's, I always compare it, it, it's better at the storm center because I can eventually come home to my bed here in Lawrenceville, but the satisfaction you get is out in the field because you, you see the impact you're having and the people are very, uh, are very appreciative. And then really my role throughout the storm is I'm the one that's uh, connecting with the state, federal and local agencies, uh, get, sharing information and also getting information from them. And then also like y'all, y'all alluded to, uh, we get a lot of press attention. So I, I take care of that back in Atlanta. So our folks in the field, they can focus on the important stuff. 
Uh, not that the press isn't important, but they can focus on get the restaurants open and taking care of our people. That's a great segue, Pat. Uh, that was going to lead into my question was how you integrate with the local community and, and local emergency management crews to let them know you're going to be there uh, supporting the local Waffle Houses in those locations. Um, how is your reach expansive enough along the coast to cover all these areas or how do you do this? Is this like a massive support regionally or, or you pull from all around to, to get these places open and provide food for everyone or, or how does it work? Yeah, good question. Well, on, on the agency side, we work uh, locally because uh, really what impacts us the most is those local decisions on the curfews and the evacuations and those are made locally by the county executive uh, in Louisiana that has the parish presidents uh, or the county executives or the sheriff. They're the ones making those decisions locally. So we try to build those relationships up now. We're actually doing that now in the pre-season of, of hurricane season. So we can uh, already have that conversation with them after the storm hits. Hopefully we don't have to have that conversation, but we already know each other. We work with the health departments. Uh, we share with them our plan so they, so they know before the storm, Here's our plan for operating a restaurant under a boil water advisory. Here's what we're going to do if there's no water. Here's what, you know, so they, they see the plans. So we do a lot of that beforehand. Then myself and some others from the office will meet with the state and uh, uh, FEMA, both in uh, D.C. and then their office here in Atlanta and their office in Denton, Texas, uh, for the regional offices. So we're in contact with them a lot uh, throughout, just mainly to build those relationships up before you need them. Uh, it, that way you've already, you know, you've already talked to them and you already know each other. A great example of that was uh, Hurricane Isaac many, many years ago. I, I was on the jump team that went into New Orleans and I was in a restaurant and we were in the restaurant we're helping out. Uh, they needed the dishes washed. So I was washing the dishes there at the high counter. I looked up and there's a lady with the clipboard. She's the local health inspector. And I was like, oh, great. You know, whew, that, that's the last thing you want to see. So I went and got the manager. Manager comes out. They knew each other by the first name, they hugged, they checked on each other's family. And so they'd already had that relationship built up uh, before the storm. And so we try to do that in, in, in all of our locations uh, locally. So we have those local relationships uh, solid before the storm. And then as it, you're talking about the logistical side of it, it's really twofold. We have what we call our operations teams of the folks that run the restaurants. They're in the restaurants every day already. We will bring in uh, restaurant operators from outside the market to help out, stage them in a safe place so they can get there right after the storm blows through. Uh, and typically, we bring them from two states over because uh, the, let's say you know it's going to hit in uh, North Carolina. Well, everybody's going to evacuate to South Carolina, Georgia, Tennessee. So we don't need to pull those people out of their market because they're going to be busy. So we'll we'll pull people from further out and and stage them. And they will come in and help uh, get the restaurants back open. A lot of times they, they are running the restaurants for the local restaurant operator because those first few days after the storm, that local restaurant operators really focused on their people, checking on them, making sure they're OK, uh, seeing what they need. A lot of times our folks are like, you know, I'm ready to work. You know, send me in, coach. And, and so they're they're really coordinating that. So we bring in the outside resources to help them get back up on their feet. And then we also have resources from our construction department that stage and they come in right after the storm to help uh, triage the restaurants, look at the damage. Uh, we also have some other folks from the corporate office that come in. We typically bring in a, somebody who's a, a, from our training department who's an expert in food safety. That's really important. So they're, they are there on site. Like I said, our senior leadership's there. We'll sometimes bring in uh, security if we set up uh, if, if we have to set up a lot of generators, we have to set up a fuel depot. And if you set up a fuel depot, you need security because everybody knows where the fuel is if they can't get it. Uh, we're also giving fuel to our associates. So we truck in big tankers of, of fuel for the generators and our people. So uh, it, it really kind of scales up depending on how big the storm is. And as the storm gets bigger, then we're going to have more resources going uh, into the storm. Uh, and unfortunately, or fortunately, we, we've experienced a lot of storms. Uh, really, our first big storm we responded to was Hugo. Uh, and so ever since then, we've been responding to storms and learning from that. And and every year, even after uh, we're, we're in the process right now, after Florence and Michael, we have probably close to 50 to 60 different things we're going to tweak just because we, we do a, 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 a big after action with our operators and everybody involved say, well, what could we done better? What did we learn from this storm? Uh, so that, that's a big part of our process too, is that, is that post-mortem after the storm. So that, that's the process we're in now. 
Very good. And I remember Hugo very well. And it's nice to know you guys have had this many years to be seasoned and experienced in this kind of thing. So uh, with that, uh, thank you for your all of those answers. It answered a lot of details for me. I know that, that was great. Uh, I'm going to pass off to Evan now. He's got a question, I think, about the index. I think we're going to move into that portion. Yeah. So, you know, Scotty had alluded earlier that uh, this index is created by FEMA. But when did that happen? Uh, I know it's been around for some years. You mentioned Hugo. Um, has it been as late uh, or as far back as Hugo that it was first created? Um, or is really it really the, the, the true Waffle House Index, we credit former FEMA Administrator Craig Fugate. He's the one that came up with it actually when he was the emergency manager in the state of Florida in 2004. They were hit with a few storms and, and he kind of came up with it and used it as a, a informal uh, way to, to judge the storm. And, and what he would tell people is, tell his people is, after the storm drive, if the Waffle House is open on full power, keep driving. If the Waffle House is on a limited menu, you need you know there's limited resources in that area, keep driving and basically drive till you find the first Waffle House that's closed because that's where it's really the, the worst and then you work your way back. When he was uh, named FEMA administrator, that came up in his hearings in front of the Senate and the Wall Street Journal did a big story on it. And then that's really when the Waffle House Index took off. And a lot of people were really paying attention to us. Uh, we, we, we say we, we love the attention. We appreciate the attention. But also there's a lot of pressure because now people are watching us. Uh, I We're in 25 states. We're not in, in, in the nation. But I got calls from reporters about our response to the California wildfires. We don't have any restaurants in California. Uh, but they just we're synonymous with crisis response. They just assumed if we if we had restaurants, we were doing something. So that really took off and uh, really Craig Fugate really uh, helped FEMA's culture get more private public partnership. Before then we kind of did our thing and, and the, the, the public sector did their thing. He really kind of brought it together because he really saw the importance of working together. And we're blessed that we get the attention, but there's a lot of great companies out there with, with great storm response. And, and FEMA listens to all of us. Uh, you, know, you have Walmart, you have Home Depot, you have Lowe's, you have Walgreens is incredible. Publix, uh, uh, the, a lot of organizations uh, have this similar response. And really what FEMA uses, they, they get that data from all of us. So they see that if we're open and there's a Walmart open and a Publix open, they don't need to put uh, uh, a supply center right there. They can use that resource and put that someplace else. And uh, they have really done a lot to engage the private sector. That has that has moved to the states and local agencies too. So FEMA now has, uh, whenever there's a storm activated, um, whenever there's a storm, they activate what's called the National Business Emergency Operations Center, where we all can join. And I'm I'm plugged into them here in Norcross, but we can share information with them in real time. And also with other companies, so I can talk to the other companies that are responding too. So they have really done a great job. We're, we're fortunate that the spotlight's on us a lot. Uh, it, we'll, we'll take it. Uh, but uh, there's a lot of companies that are doing a lot of good things for their communities, and, and FEMA really has locked into that. And, and I think it kind of boils down to the Waffle House Index. But there, there, there's a lot of good going out there with, with the private sector companies. You mentioned that there's those the three levels of the index. I think. Uh, open, limited, and closed. Uh, how do they? I mean, how is that incorporated in uh, you know, their website and how they deal with outreach across the southeast when there's a hurricane or something like that? Yeah, uh, other companies are more sophisticated than we are. I I send them an Excel spreadsheet twice a day, <laughs> and they have to incorporate it in, and 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 they create a map that has all the uh, all the all the private sectors on there. There there's others that are more. Uh, tech savvy than we are, but we still do the old fashioned Excel spreadsheet and share that with them. Uh, and, and it's funny there uh, in, in the last uh, in the current administration and, and the past administration, we didn't get that spreadsheet in on time. And it was funny because we, uh, we we got a call saying that both President Obama and President Trump are waiting to see the status of the Waffle House restaurants, which that blew our minds because we're thinking, you know, that they should be focused on more important things. But uh, we can just say to them, you know, yes, President Trump, they're serving bacon. We're good. Uh, but, but so, uh, we're updating in real time in that, uh, uh, national business emergency operations center, but, I, but we send them twice a day, uh, uh, open, closed 
update which ones are on generator we actually get in more detail because they, they want to know which ones are on generator which ones are on boil water things like that so it, it's a pretty pretty big spreadsheet awesome thank you thanks for answering my questions yeah pat so i got a question here uh is there any coordination done with i know you talked about uh, you know building the partnerships with local and local units mr local municipalities and such but before an event which is extremely important now once once you know an event starts like you know hurricane florence or hurricane michael what is uh, the usual i guess game plan for for your response you know not just with local but regional and federal assets i mean did they did they got did they call you up and say hey we could use you over here or you know how does that work yeah really we're kind of uh more independent than that we, we just let them know which restaurants we're opening up uh because because that's the best thing we can do uh we do set up a lot of times before storms coming with the power companies to the national guard local municipalities where we will uh cater them they, they'll come by in the morning and pick up you know so many breakfasts or lunch uh so that that usually happens as that storm's coming on and, and we have some relationships already built up with some of the power companies you know and unfortunately when you go to a lot of storms, it's everybody's everybody's driving this way on the interstate, and then we're on this side of the interstate with the same power companies and, and those people, and we're going into the storm. Uh, so we have built those relationships up, uh, which that helps us too. If if uh, you know we need to get power back on quickly at a restaurant and we're feeding them, they're going to probably make sure that we get the power back on more quickly. Uh, so, but we we set those up. But really, we're we're focused on those restaurants. We did. Twice we, we we have a resource that we deployed uh, a few years ago. Baton Rouge has some bad flooding. And then just most recently in Michael in Panama City, we had two restaurants that the one in pa in Baton Rouge was flooded and it was going to take a while to get reopened. In Panama City, within the city, there was nothing. So we actually deployed our food truck down there and set that up after the storm. And uh, for uh, Hurricane Michael, we set it up in front of a restaurant and, and gave away close and we gave away we gave away food and we gave away close to six thousand meals uh just to the community just because they had no other place to eat so uh we will hear that sometimes too i, I remember the the flooding in uh, columbia south carolina the word kind of got out that we need uh we need uh fresh water so we were able to get a truck in a couple of trucks into our restaurants and then let the local authorities know you know come by this restaurant and we have a truck full of uh gallons of water and so we We'll listen to them and 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 see how it's going. And sometimes they'll reach out to us, but but most time they're they're interested in which restaurants are open, and and what are we facing to get the supplies in. Uh, that's another big part that they want to know about, so they can they can kind of help ease that up for all the private sector people. Oh, that's that's awesome. And uh, you know, I can tell you just from a personal note, I spent 15 years before I you know got into weather as a firefighter, and actually you know the, you talk about the floods of 2015 in Columbia. I was one of the people I rescued, and you know we rescued almost 200 people in the first 48 yeah. hours of that event. And uh, you know from from the the outpouring of support from all the business local businesses, national businesses, and nonprofits, uh, you, you know you guys make a world of difference. And just you know me personally, thank you. You're welcome. You know we. We say our responsibility for responding to storms uh, twofold. One, it's it's to our associates. Uh, if we're not open, they're not making money. It's that simple. And we feel we got a responsibility to get open quickly because they've just come through. Like the folks I was m meeting with down in Panama City, they've come through some some horrendous situations where they have to repair their homes and all. So they need to get back to making money. So that that really drives us. And the second is for our customers and the community because. Because we've seen it through the years, you know, starting with Hugo, that the more quickly we can get open, the more the community comes back. If they see our signs are lit up, then we see other other businesses are starting to open. And plus, it gives folks, hey, we made it through this. We're, we're going to be OK. Uh, our goal is for more restaurants to open up. And we actually do talk to other restaurants. Uh, FEMA has invited us to speak to different seminars. And, and we're, we're open with other restaurants to, to show what we do because we we feel the faster we all get back, the better uh and and so we've done that and in 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 some situations we'll have a restaurant next to us uh, a, a competitor throughout the year but after the the hurricane there's no power but we have a a, a refrigerated truck on our property we'll let them store their product in in, in our truck uh just because because our, our goal is to get everybody back quickly it, it, it's not just about us and and whatever we can do to get the community back so those are the two things that really drive us because uh, people ask us why we do it uh, I will tell you, 
We don't make money off of it. We, we, we throw a lot of resources at these. Uh, Wilmington, North Carolina, for example, uh, it, it was basically an island with all the flooding. And we had restaurants there. We were basically flying in people in supplies. Uh, air, we, we call it a, you know, an airlift. We, we brought in people in supplies for one day because we could not get trucks into Wilmington. And, and that's not the most cost-effective way to run a restaurant is to staff it by flying things in. So uh, uh, short term, we do not make a lot of money, but long term, it pays off because people still remember us from Hugo. They remember us from the, 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 the Columbia floods. They remember us from Katrina. Uh, so the, the long, term, long term goodwill with the community is what pays for it for us. That, that's awesome. I think, uh, who's up next? I think Evan, yeah. Yeah, so stepping away from the index for a second, the houses themselves, the Waffle Houses, y'all stay open a lot uh, longer, per se, uh, in storms than most other restaurants around. Uh, I think you're pretty renowned for that, actually. How do you manage to stay open amidst, you know, some people throw out safety concerns uh, and other issues? How do you, you know, deal with that? Well, again, we're, we're in contact with, like I said, the, typically it's the county or the local governments that, that's setting those evacuations, setting the curfews. We're in contact with them. Uh, once it's a mandatory evacuation, we're not going to be open. Uh, we're not going to we're not going to have anybody in harm's way. Uh, but right up until then, we'll try to stay open the best we can. And and the the deciding factor is uh, the people resource. Uh, and unfortunately, Florida gets a lot of storms. And I think uh, to be quite honest, a lot of folks in Florida didn't think Michael was going to be that big a deal. And so a lot of our folks didn't evacuate. Uh, and and the, and fortunately, everybody was safe. Uh, and, and nobody was injured, but there, there's there's some harrowing stories of, you know, they, they should have got out of there because that was a category four when it hit. Uh, but they had so many storms and the, this is just this isn't going to be a big deal. And, and it was. And I think you you face that a lot, especially on, on the Gulf Coast when they're used to when they, there's a few storms. So a lot of times we're having to get our people to leave because they don't want to. Uh, but yeah, we're, we're in contact with the counties and, and, and the states on, on those, uh, uh, evacuations and, and try to monitor them very quickly and closely. And we try to get our folks out of harm's way and, and stage them in the right place, uh, so they can come in right after the storm. So Pat, you were talking about, um, Wilmington per se. Um, when you guys are operating in a, in a storm zone, you, you have different types of menus. Um, First of all, you know, you've got to keep food cold and, you know, you, maybe you can only cook certain items. So uh, if you can kind of talk to us about what those, I think there's like three different four categories of menus. Uh, can you talk to us about that and maybe what is uh, what are some of the things on those menus? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, right after the storm, I will tell you they're going to cook what is safe. Uh, they probably haven't got the truck resupplied. Uh, we, again, not a very smart business decision before the as we're tracking the storm we will stock all the restaurants up and we're basically betting that they're going to be okay uh so we will stock the restaurants full before we evacuate uh, a lot of places will put a small generator on that can run the cooler uh and just in case we lose power so we'll do that and, and so really right after the storm they're coming in the restaurant they're they're if, if the food is safe they will cook what's in the in in the cooler because we we got to get rid of that food because we got more food coming in. And then it really depends on the situation. We have, uh, I, I can't think off the top of my head, but I'll, I'll try to go through all of them. We have a menu where let's say that we have um, no water. So we have a menu that we have items on there that we can prepare and serve that we don't need water. We have a no power menu. We have a, an emergency menu, which is basically no power and really bad and that's going to be basically you're going to get a cheeseburger or 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 some scrambled eggs uh i think in wilmington we were down to just serving two things and but people were fine they we basically said you want breakfast or lunch and you got eggs or you got a, you got a hamburger uh and it really depends on what resources we have and then once we're up and running we might still have a limited menu just because we're the only only thing open we're gonna have a lot of volume so we'll, we might pare down the menu where it's just uh uh simple to cook items that we can get out quickly you know burgers and hash browns eggs hash browns bacon sausage well sausage sorry we don't do bacon it takes up too much grill space uh so we like to do sausage 
ham's great because it's already cooked. You just have to heat it up. Uh, so we go through our, our, our items and see what we can do. Uh, one of the things I will tell you that if it's a no water menu, we will not serve waffles. Uh, the reason is, is not we don't need the waffles to make the waffle mix. It's the cleanup. Uh, we, we, we store our batter in one gallon, basically plastic buckets. And we realized after one storm, we had so many stacked up in the back room. And if you have no water, we're basically uh, setting up, you know, the Cajun cookers out back to boil the water to make it to wash the dishes. And, and we just realized it's not worth it. So uh, there's no waffles on the no water menu, uh, mainly because of the cleanup. So we, we go through that and, and we learned some things in this storm that we're going to tweak our menus. Uh, and really, we we allow that flexibility for those decisions to be made in the field. Uh, some restaurants might be on this menu, but right down the street, they have more resources, so they'll be on that this menu. That that call is made in the field, and we support it back at the office. Uh, so our, our operators on the ground are, are making those decisions. And our goal is to get back to the full menu as quickly as possible, but sometimes the, the resources don't allow us to do that. So, Pat, I think I can speak to everyone on the panel saying you're making us extremely hungry at this point. Um, <laughs> but as you're talking about the menu and you're talking about the limited, um, you know, based on whether you have power, you have water, one of the things that kind of struck me the most in looking at some of the images that were coming out of the devastation that we saw down in Bay and Gulf Counties um, with, with Michael was the Waffle House food truck. Now, that was not something I've seen before. I don't know if you guys, if it's something new to the Waffle House that you've uh, started to deploy to some of these harder hit areas. Could you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, we, we about five years ago, we got a food truck here and it's based in Atlanta. We have one. It gets around so people think we have a lot of them, but we only have one and it's mainly for catering. Uh, uh, it, it is book solid. Uh, it, it's amazing how many weddings they do. We have the Super Bowl coming up in Atlanta. They're already booked for all these different parties. Uh, but uh, twice we've deployed it. We, we kind of use it as a uh, part of our uh, relief effort. If we have a restaurant that's really damaged and like we had in Panama City where we knew we weren't going to be able to open it up for weeks, maybe a month because it had some major structural damage, uh, we, we brought it to that. We also brought it to Baton Rouge after a flood. We had a restaurant that was flooded. So we'll deploy that if if we need that resource down there. And both in both cases, it was giving away food uh, just because both both areas didn't have any food at all. So we, we gave away 6,000 meals down in Panama City. Uh, it was close to, I think, 900 meals a day in Baton Rouge when we did it up there. Uh, so that's just something we use it if, if, if we need that resource. And luckily it's based here in Atlanta so we can get it pretty much anywhere pretty quickly. Uh, I, I, I hear rumor we might be getting a second truck, which I'm very excited about because I, I do a lot of uh, uh, events and community relations things, and sometimes I can't get the truck. It, it's already booked. So I, you know, and it, it's really booked. It's, it's amazing. They'll do like four or five weddings in the summer that where they roll into a wedding. Uh, it, it's amazing that people have embraced that food truck, and it, it will. Uh, it it has made its way up to the Carolinas. Like I say, we only have one of them, but it gets around, so people think we have a lot of them. Uh, but it, it will it will go all over the place for different events. Uh, and, and and basically, it's a, a food truck, but it has the same grill setup we have in the restaurant. So it has the two flat tops and it has the, the, the two eye burner and some waffle bakers and refrigeration. Uh, typically, we have to bring some support vehicles with it, uh, typically a refrigeration truck, especially on we're going to be there for a while to support the truck. But we can we basically cook what we can in a restaurant out of the truck. So that, that's kind of a, a stop gap that we have to use sometimes. And so, Pat, we really enjoyed um, learning a lot about what you guys do, and um, I'm just astonished at what you guys do and, and the, uh, the the spirit that you guys given uh, given to the communities who have been affected. And, and that's where we kind of want to start to um, transition to the last part of our interview is uh, some of those stories that you've been able to hear, maybe from colleagues uh, of some of these areas. And, you know, we can talk about Michael and Harvey and Irma and uh, Florence and, and Katrina you were talking about. Uh, is there any stories from some some of these uh, major events that kind of reminisce in your mind and you're just kind of just like your jaw drops when, when you hear these stories of how these communities who've been affected by this are, are actually, it probably brings a smile to them knowing that you guys are there there to help them. Yeah, I think uh, what, what I take away from is how, how, you know, how great our associates are. 
I mean, it's amazing what, you know, what they've gone through. And then, you know, they're there to serve their customers. I just got back from Panama City, talked to a lot of our associates down there, what they went through. Just heard some some incredible stories of uh, one of our cooks had to walk eight miles because his his home was destroyed. And, and he was one of those that thought it wasn't going to be a big storm. And he's, he walked out and went to the local, the, the nearest restaurant. Uh, we had two other uh, associates who came in from Mobile to help out on a jump team. And they were working in a restaurant. And they bonded so much with their customers. When, they're, when their time was to go back to Mobile, the customers uh, begged them to stay. And actually, one customer gave them his condo on the beach to stay in. So they're staying in this <laughs> incredible condo on the 21st floor because uh, this customer didn't want them to go back to Mobile because he had made that bond with them. They were right there after the storm. So they stay. They're actually now. I talk to them. They're going to relocate and they're going to move to Panama City now. Uh, we have some other stories of uh, folks down there uh, that just overcome a lot to uh, to do uh, to just to get that good comfort food. Uh, another great story was uh, many years ago in Oklahoma. Uh, Norman, Oklahoma, had like one week with just three incredible tornadoes. Uh, blew through and we we had a group of associates who they made it through they were fine but they knew that the restaurant was going to be uh, uh, busy so they got in the car and what would have taken like a five minute trip because of all the debris uh, took them about an hour to drive to this restaurant uh, and they had to talk their way through like four uh, uh, police uh, uh, barricades and they basically said, we have to get to the Waffle House because we have people wanting to eat. And, it, and it's just that, that, that dedication blows me away for people who want to, you know, get there. And, and you know, when you think about it, it makes sense because our, our restaurants are tiny. Uh, people are in there every day and they build that connection with their server. And, and, and that happens all the time after the storm. The customers are coming to the restaurant to check in to make sure their favorite Waffle House people are okay. Then, the, then we're checking on the customers. It's really that sense of community within that little store. Uh, that goes on. And, and so uh, th those stories are big. Uh, another story happened many, many, many years ago. Uh, we, uh, we had a supplier bring, uh, I won't say their name, but they brought a truck of soft drinks in from their headquarters in Atlanta. And uh, they showed up and it was a truck full of soft drinks. And uh, they said, well, uh, we need to unload this. And our, our folks said, we, we can't unload this. So Somebody back here in Atlanta was able to get to the CEO of this organization who called that poor truck driver who probably never met the CEO. And the CEO basically said, give Waffle House the keys to that truck. They'll give it to us when it's over. And we got we got them a ride back. So uh, our suppliers go above and beyond, uh, too, because because they know the impact that uh, when we're open and, and, and using you, we need those supplies uh, to get open. Uh, that, that, that That's kind of a Waffle House legend story that. That goes back a couple decades, but uh, it, you know, uh, I've been on the jump team a few times. Like I said, in Hurricane Isaac, uh, you just have families. Uh, it's their first hot meal, and, and and it's very emotional. And they can charge their cell phone. It's the first time they've probably been in air conditioning in a couple of days. Uh, and I had family after family talking about, you know, this is our first meal. We've we've been eating, you know, canned stuff, and and they hug you and and. And it, it, it's amazing that sense of community that little bitty shoe, shoe box has. But I, I think it really shines in, in times like this. Uh, every day we'd like to have that sense of family in that restaurant. But it, after something like a big hurricane, that, that's where you really rely on your family. And we feel like that, that family is pretty strong in that restaurant. Yeah, that's a good point because the heat is, is so oppressive after these storms because it's so muggy and, and humid. A lot of times that you know especially after florence it's just i mean what do you do you can't you can't escape it you know i mean we're lucky if you get a cool down after a hurricane i remember after hugo it was just miserable no power it was great if you could hit a grocery store where there was some power and have that little blast of ac it was it was wonderful but uh yeah it's nice that you guys do that for uh, yeah, a, lot, a lot of people don't realize you know typically after a, a hurricane the weather is gorgeous <laughs> i mean it's clear skies but it's hot and humid but everybody thinks you're when we come into our response after the hurricane that we're in rain and all typically after the storm blows through it's it's gorgeous weather it's, it's sunny skies but but you're right it, it's hot and and humid 
Pat, we, uh, we, we've had a lot of response. I was just looking at some of uh, the comments. Um, one guy in particular, Nick Craig, he said uh, he was actually in the Wilmington Waffle House this year. Uh, Darren Florence was talking about his experience there, and he uh, just uh, sends his appreciation and gratitude to uh, what you guys were able to do in the Wilmington area. As we kind of uh, end up with our interview, um, one last question, ta talking about these storm stories. I know you were able to, to go out to these different events, um, particularly here in the Carolinas. You know, we've had Matthew, and we've had Florence, and we've had the Columbia floods. Um, any um, any particular things that kind of stick out here in the Carolinas that uh, that you experienced uh, through through these recovery efforts? I remember the Columbia floods, of, especially because I've, I've I, I came in right after that with with that truck of water uh, and, and just the appreciation people had, and uh, it was almost it was kind of surreal as you're as you're as you're coming into something like this, and you have uh, the supplies and and the truck behind you. How you know uh people are excited to see you this, this happened in panama city we had a restaurant that our folks got to to get open quickly and the word got out that the restaurant was getting ready to get open and so the parking lot was full of people cheering our folks as they showed up and and one one of our managers said i felt like i was going into the big game and going through the tunnel because the the customers were outside cheering us as we got there because they needed to get the restaurant open uh and uh you know, stories like that. Uh, another one comes to mind. We had a, a ice storm in Atlanta a few years ago, which you know the nation made fun of us because it was it was nothing, but the whole city shut down. And we had a restaurant off of uh, uh, Georgia Highway 400, and uh, it was just a district manager and a cook was the only one in this in this restaurant. But everybody had abandoned their cars on the highway and walked up the exit to that restaurant, and they were. The, they were the only two people in the restaurant and they were like, what do we do? Uh, and I think the customers were worried that they're going to shut down. So the customers actually got behind the counter and helped them serve other customers. So our, our two employees cooked and the other people took the orders, bust the table, wash the dishes because they couldn't, they didn't want the restaurant to shut down because that was their, that was their place. They were getting warm. They were able to charge their cell phones and they were able to eat. And a lot of them stayed there for like two or three meals because they, the whole city was was paralyzed and they were there for like 12 hours so that that's another neat story uh that happened and then uh on wilmington uh, uh i should have sent you the link i, I think it was uh wral uh, the reporter and photographer were in our restaurant eating and looked up and realized that our uh well first our our corporate head of it was on the door uh, we had about three executive vice presidents in their busing table. Our CEO was behind the counter and our chairman of the board was all in there at the same time. And so they, being good reporters, they grabbed their camera and did a story about that. But uh, that that story is great because that kind of shows our response that everybody's there just to get the restaurants open and, and doing whatever they can uh, to, uh, to, to, to serve the folks there. And like I said, the, the, uh, the reporter was just lucky. There's another story i think jim cantori was in downtown wilmington and he walked in on a restaurant that had no power and the, and they were in there because they had gas they were cooking and and he went live he was live uh and i think that's out there too so those are two good if, if you want to see the waffle house index uh in action uh google those and, and and take a look at those pat it's been fascinating to hear about this and uh before this show uh, the audience, uh, they didn't hear this, but Pat has uh, has told us during hurricane season this upcoming year that he doesn't mind giving us some updates from time to time if it's affecting the Carolinas. So we're definitely going to take you up on that, Pat. Okay, I, I'll be there. I appreciate the uh, the opportunity you've given us tonight, a little bit of your time. Uh, just I'm a, I've always loved Waffle House, but after tonight, I love it even more. I mean, this this has been awesome, and uh, just the uh, the given spirit that you guys have for the communities affected is just amazing and. Uh, I, I know that good things are going to continue for Waffle House for what you guys are doing for the community. Um, if any of our, our, our followers tonight are watching live or those on the podcast version, if they want to keep up with, with you guys at Waffle House or, or the Waffle House um, storm recovery efforts, is there uh, any social media pages or something they can follow to kind of keep up with the, uh, the efforts? Yeah, typically on a, on a storm, we will post a lot to our, our social media, uh, Twitter mainly, uh, uh, we use at Waffle House News is one of our handles. And of course, at Waffle House is, is the mothership uh, of, of all of our, our, our Twitter. But uh, we will push things out on Twitter, some on Facebook, but typically more on Twitter. 
because uh, it's more, uh, uh, more it's quicker to get things out. We'll do a little bit on Instagram, but if you want to follow the index, uh, follow the Waffle House News and Waffle House. Great information with Pat. Feel free to stick around. We're going to go to a quick break. I'm going to pass it over to uh, executive producer James Barton, who has an update on some current weather news. Thank you very much, uh, Scotty, and thanks for Pat and for everyone who's watched online commenting tonight. Stay tuned. We're going to have an update on your weekend weather coming up in just a moment. You maybe heard the possibility of some snow, and we'll break that down and explain. But we wanted to take a few minutes because in this time slot, we've gotten used to rolling some sort of break. We don't really run commercials at this point, but you've seen in weeks past videos featuring some recent accomplishments, uh, maybe in space by NASA. We, we don't have any NASA video for you this week. Uh, it's all because of the government shutdown, and we don't talk about politics on this show, and we don't talk about walls, uh, and we don't really talk about Congress on this show. But we do want to talk about the men and women of the National Weather Service and other federal agencies who are continuing to work right now around the clock to keep us safe and informed and aren't getting paid right now. So tomorrow will be the first day that they actually miss a paycheck. And while we can't fix that here at the Carolina Weather Group, we wanted to take a moment to acknowledge them and let them know that we do appreciate all the hard work that they're doing. The uh, Washington Post had a story out about this, and they spoke to a manager of a local National Weather Service office who did not wish to be named in order to protect his or her own job. But they said something along the line of, it's a bit of a slap in the face when you have the lack of empathy from politicians and the public. We, we don't want them to feel that way. And they also went on to say, getting paid eventually, but we have bills today. And so we wanted to acknowledge that. We wanted to make sure that you at home realize that there are folks working around the clock right now to, uh, to keep us safe and keep us informed. And so our shout out tonight goes out to the National Weather Service and all those local offices here in the Carolinas and the, around the United States uh, as they continue to work to keep us informed uh, during this government shutdown. But it's not just them as well. It's National Parks. It's TSA. Uh, even guys, we were talking about this before the show, the GFS model being impacted here because although it's running, it's not running most optimized as it can be. And so, you know, even this government shutdown, as it carries on here, affecting us back in the weather community. Let's bring back in now the panel. And, uh, Scotty, we were looking at that GFS model uh, just before the show, right? And we, we're we getting the data, but, you know, we're kind of putting an asterisk on it. Is that right? Yeah, that's right, uh, James. Uh, unfortunately, just we, we don't have all the data that, uh, that's being fed into that model right now that uh, we normally would if everything was running well. Um, so, you know, we're still looking at the GFS, but you have to also keep that in the back of your mind. Hey, not all of that data is being fed into it right now. So it's definitely uh, caused some issues throughout the weather community. And I'm going to bring in uh, Melissa here because Melissa does a lot of research. And Melissa, this is also kind of affected your research that you've done for uh, for some of the rainfall totals in South Carolina. Yeah, we've um, we've had actually North Carolina and South Carolina are looking at the potential of having um, new annual record rainfall totals. So in North Carolina, Mount Mitchell has a rainfall total for 2018 of about 139.94 inches, which could stand as a new annual record. And in South Carolina, we're looking at a station um, in Jocassi, which is a record, and this is no coincidence, of 123.45 inches um, for 2018. And this, these totals have to go through what's known as the State Climate, uh, State Climate Extremes Committee. And that is a member from the National Weather Service Office for that forecast area, which for both of these are actually going to be our Greenville-Spartanburg office um, that we share across the state line. And we have to bring in an official from the NWS region um, and, and a representative from um, the uh, NCEI, which is, you know, the, the, the archive of all the data, along with state climatologists. And so, you know, there's only so much that we can do in verifying these totals and moving forward to make them the official record um, because everything has been kind of put to a hold. So um, we're hoping to jump on those two and, uh, you know, those two records uh, across the Carolinas here and be able to verify whether or not we have new state records, which um, is kind of interesting because most people would think that those records, if we did have them in the state, would be in the areas that were impacted, um, you know, by Florence because that was where you heard of all the rain falling, but it really was in the more mountainous areas in 2018. It definitely was. We broke uh, several records here in Western North Carolina. Um, Evan, I'll bring you in this because you, uh, you along with me, live here in Western North Carolina, and uh, it's been a pretty wet year. Uh, we've had several uh, places, uh, like Melissa was talking about, over the 100-inch mark. 
Yeah, yeah. I mean, it really got cranking in May, um, and it just, just didn't stop for the rest of the year. Uh, I think May was a record uh, wettest month at Asheville. Uh, December was as well, uh, and I believe one other month. And uh, December, I mean, was it the 29th of December that we had that last big rainfall? Um, and the Asheville airport recorded over five inches of rain in 24 hours, which is just absurd. Um, this flooding and landslides, it's been a, been a wild rain year. It has, and we, we've started off uh, wet as well with the rainstorm um, just right after New Year's. Uh, big news story also, uh, and I'll bring the entire panel in on this. We'll have a little discussion before uh, we end tonight. Uh, another potential uh, winter storm uh, moving into the area. And, James, I'm going to uh, screen share my screen here because uh, this is about only the, the most comfortable thing I've, I've, I've feel like going with right now because we just don't want it throughout accumulations uh, this is from the weather prediction center and this is kind of just the probabilities of seeing snowfall um, in western North Carolina so this is uh, through Saturday afternoon um, this is um, uh, probabilities for one inch or more of snow and as you can see up here in the uh, North Carolina mountains uh, the uh, the ski slope areas like Beach Mountain Sugar Mountain uh, places like that see the highest potential of seeing uh, accumulating snow up to 40 percent chance of one inch of snow and then as you go into the foothills uh, let's say Marion Morganton Lenore Hickory places like that it's anywhere between 20 and 30 percent James as we get into your area well I'm sorry, you, it doesn't show you any snow at all. And <laughs> what else is new? It seems like we always, uh, sorry, I didn't mean to go off this page. Uh, it seems like we always face that issue with you guys on the Interstate 85 corridor where maybe northern Mecklenburg County gets some snow and down where you are in southern Mecklenburg gets a cold rain. Yeah, and I think that's exactly right, Scotty. You know, most of the time that's how this plays out. And what I keep just trying to tell people about this forecast is everyone's kind of getting into this hype. It's January it's winter the higher elevations are getting snow that's how it works so i don't really ex expect it to really impact us here in the lower elevations in in, in charlotte and that's why I, I agree with you that i think this map is a pretty good representation of of what it is we could see now if it gets back into the i-77 corridor maybe closer to greensboro that would be i think noteworthy but i i don't think we're in for an end-all storm but you know it's like we always say it never hurts to be prepared because whether you eat those pop tarts this weekend or some other time they're not going bad <laughs> that's right um i'll show you this map one more time if i was a betting man and then i want to toss it to shay because uh shay does a lot of long-term looking and um bring evan in and chris and whoever else as we talk about this pattern change but if you want to see snow i think you would have to go uh this line between greensboro winston-salem through statesville uh, through portions of Catawba County back into the Asheville area. Uh, if you draw a line literally on Interstate 40 and north, I think that's going to be your best chance of seeing some type of uh, frozen precipitation. It looks like it may start off as a rain-snow mix, change the snow, and then back to an icy mix before it all moves out on Sunday. So uh, we will continue to watch um, this, um, this storm develop. I wish we had some more uh, information for you uh, to kind of tell you what's going on, but... We will talk about it, and uh, we'll continue to do updates. And if we need to do a, um, a weather uh, special, maybe Friday night or something like that, before the storm, we can do that. Uh, Shay, you uh, and Jared and, and Evan, who is in Charleston, you guys, it looks like it just may be a rain event for you all, but uh, it's much cooler down in your area as well as this cold front has moved through and we start to see this pattern change. Yeah, that's right. That's exactly right. I mean, we have... Um... A large area of high pressure that's that's building down out of the northern tier and so that's just forcing cold air down all the way and then down slope all the way to the coastline so that looks to be the pattern for tomorrow and friday we're gonna be pretty chilly here in the upper 40s to near 50 for highs and down near freezing at night so take care of the people pets plants and pipes are the four p's that we cover um you know we're not really built for free freezing pipes we're not looking at deep freeze or anything but just just to be aware uh, at least for pets and plants and children and whatnot, uh, to, to be aware that it's going to get very cold at nighttime. Uh, but as we get, I think as we get into the weekend, we warm up a little bit around this low. We're going to be on the so southern side of this. So we're going to have a southerly draw with a little bit of warm sector uh, out ahead of it. Uh, and then wrapping around that after this low exits, it's going to get cold again. And I think that's going to be a pattern for a little while. I mean, we are in the winter, as James says. 
uh, and El Nino is still, we're still in El Nino watch as of January the 7th. That was the last diagnosis from the ENSO uh, from the CPC. So we're still in this sort of El Nino-ish pattern where we could get this moisture continuing to stream in the Southeast region, which that looks to be a, a pretty typical pattern. We finally got five or six dry days out of this since um, our last soaking. And so we've been very fortunate to have that, but we're getting ready to get another wet pattern as we get into the weekend. Then we could be following that with a succession of wet patterns every few days or so uh, as El, the El Nino keeps the stream of moisture up from the south. Now, the big question is going to be as we get towards the last couple of weeks of January, are we going to enter into a, a pretty cold pattern along the eastern U.S.? And some of the signals are saying yes, and some of the uh, temperatures in the northern tier are going to get very cold. And then that, that means additional cold weather for the southeast region. So there may be more potential for some wintry uh, storms or wintry precipitation events that occur just a matter of how far south it goes. So that, that is, uh, we are entering the prime season for it, Scotty. Now, I guess I'll pass that on to Jared. Did Jared, did you want to say anything about Charleston for right now? You know, and I think, uh, and I saw that Scotty forgot to unmute his mic and that's, I'm sorry, man. Never I'm change. A, never <laughs> changes. You know, new year, new me, except for <laughs> unmuting. But, but, uh, one thing about Charleston in particular that's actually rather interesting is that we haven't been up below freezing since uh, mid-December. And we haven't had a sub-30 degree temperature since the last day of January 2018. So to give you a general idea, it hasn't been that cold here. I know we started last year with a snowstorm. And it seemed impossible to believe that, you know, that, that you know, we started with a snowstorm. Man, 2018 was such a cold year. It really wasn't. And so we're going to be uh, seeing some cold shots that we haven't seen for actually quite a while here. So I hope people are preparing. There's, uh, you know, there's good, the potential for some agricultural issues. I've gotten a lot of reports from people in my own nose telling me that stuff is trying to bloom. Uh, pollen's out there. Azaleas uh, are blooming now. So we're seeing springtime. Mm -hmm. Don't be fooled because uh, we still have some cold weather to deal with for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and I guess the only thing that's worse is if this was happening in the second half of January into February, as we had last year, followed up by freezing in a lot of spots in March. And that, you know, you know that, that can be a billion-dollar disaster. It's not a hurricane. It's not a tornado. It's not a severe winter storm. It can just be cold temperatures, and that'll do it for a lot of uh, agricultural interest. So it's not gonna, that's going to be something that, that we're going to need to keep a close eye on. Definitely so. And I want to bring in Chris Jackson here as we kind of close out this conversation. Chris, you did a, a great blog. I think it was yesterday or maybe on Monday. And you kind of util, uh, hinted to this pattern change. And uh, Shay was talking about it looks like the latter half of January into February, we're going to see this cold pattern. And it looks like we're going to head on to this wet pattern that's being continued. And it's only time, time's only going to allow that we're going to see another winter weather event or two in the area. Yeah, that's right, Scotty. Uh, you know, just like we talked about really through the middle of November and, and into December, you know, that I guess the middle half of November, all the way almost till Christmas, we were in a prime winter pattern where we're getting these, you know, these these big low pressure systems, you know, to, to ride the, the Gulf Coast and cross over Florida up, up the eastern seaboard. And, you know, we were getting these systems every four to four to six days and, and you're getting one to two inches of rain in Columbia, which if you, you know, if we're in winter, winter weather in snow mode, uh, that that's a lot of snow, especially if you start talking snowfall ratios, where generally speaking, you, know, you get 10 inches of snow at a one inch of uh, precipitation. But, you know, getting in so far after Christmas, New Year's, first part of 2019, the pattern flopped. And, you know, with that with that big ridge over the eastern United States, it, it's just been warm here. And it's been, it's been nice. It's been a good change, but, uh, you know, kind of ready to get back to winter. And it, it looks like it's going to, you know, sometimes it, it takes a while for the, for the cold air to really – you know, beat off the warm air, uh, trying to, you know, move up out of the Gulf. And going forward with this storm this weekend is it, going to be a prime example. We're going to have another wedge set up uh, Saturday night into Sunday as, as a low. Really, it's a weak, it's going to be a weak area surface, low pressure. It's going to uh, basically try to go up the western side of the mountains, but it's not going to be able to. So what's going to happen, a new, a new center of uh, low pressure will form off the North Carolina coast. And what that's going to do is, basically going to cause uh, another rainstorm. But, uh, you know, you folks up in the mountains and in the upstate, probably going to see a mixed bag of a little bit of everything, especially Saturday night through Sunday. Uh, probably some sleet, freezing rain. But, uh, yeah, hopefully this uh, this pattern is stick and we can start getting some reinforcing shots of cold air. 
And, uh, you know, for the snow lovers like me and like a lot of other people, I I'd love to see a little bit of snow before it gets 95 degrees again. It's coming. I have a feeling when it gets here, we're going to see several <laughs> storms. So uh, the one person on our panel who will see the biggest impacts uh, is Peter Planamente. And Peter, uh, up in your neck of the woods, uh, you guys haven't had a lot of snow. This might be probably the biggest storm you've seen this year, right? Or this winter season. Yeah, so far it's looking like this is going to be the biggest one. And uh, I know a lot of people up here are craving for a snowstorm. I mean, we're only at the beginning of January, uh, but people are going crazy jumping off the deep end already. So we got a lot of time to go. Uh, there could be plenty more uh, between now and March. But uh, next couple of days are going to be really chilly and windy. Uh, we're looking at highs hovering around the freezing mark. And then uh, Saturday into Sunday, we could be looking at that storm coming up from the south. Uh, that could give us a couple inches of snow. Um, can't give too much detail right now. Of course, we still got a couple days to go, but um, it's looking like we could get impacted by this. And um, like we said, it could be the biggest storm of the season so far. Uh, so there's going to be a very sharp cutoff. We don't know where that's going to end up as of yet. Um, you know, anywhere south of Philly has a pretty good uh, shot of getting um, a couple inches of snow. So it doesn't look like it's going to be anything too major. It's not going to be a big nor'easter, uh, but Still, it's going to impact something uh, around here. So we'll see how it turns out the next couple of days. Uh, I know the uh, news stations here are going crazy and trying to figure out uh, what to tell people right now because, you know, some people love it. Some people hate it. But uh, at least it's over the weekend, so people will stay home more, I guess. But um, they don't have to go to work, which I don't know. They probably want to be home from work. But, um, yeah, we'll see how it turns out. So, yeah, that's the latest. Yeah, that's uh, that's uh, finally your people are getting some snow. So I know uh, I know you're not happy about it, but there are some people up there. Yeah. Hey Scott, hey Scott, I got one more quick one. I want to follow up on what Peter said and, and just kind of get y'all. I want to get everybody's thoughts on this. Even with the active southern uh, track that we had, you know, mid November through December, we didn't see mi any real prolific nor'easters. And, and even some of the the model guidance suggests this storm will be much the same way. You know, once it once it passes out you know, past Hatteras, it, it gets it swept a lot further east than, you know, what we're used to with storms passing near the benchmark and being, you know, these prolific 30-inch blizzards in Boston. Now, what do you, you think is causing that? I think the polar jet is probably causing that. There's a lot of movement to the north, a lot of traffic from west to east. And so um, it's almost like a pre predisposition uh, set up for the, the stratospheric polar vortex displacement. You know, it's almost like we're waiting for that, that giant Rossby to make its way across. And so there's a lot of that forward traffic and that momentum going ahead of it. We got a large storm about to impact Northwest Pacific States right now. So there's a, a there's not a lot of um, typhoon action in the Western Pacific drawing energy and teleconnection, but there there is a, a nice forward surge going on. So we'll just have to watch I'd say watch the polar jet at 300 millibar level and, and see. Uh, I might be able to pull that up here in just a second. We'll, we'll talk about it after the show. But, I mean, that that might be one cue to find out why there's so much movement in these mid to upper lows moving away to the east very quickly. So without without a Rossby wave, you don't have a large dip that it really draws up the coastline to. Um, and so that that's sort of – that's my thoughts. But to be honest, uh, even here in the northeast, it's really cold uh, yet. I mean, we haven't had anything below freezing, really, um, so far. So we've been kind of stuck in the 40s, and we've been getting a lot of uh, heavy rain events and flooding. So um, not – I mean, we have had snow events the last couple of months, but it really has not been anything too significant. It's been more mixing and uh, just heavy rain and flooding. Yep, yeah, I'll, I'll pull it up. I don't know if you can see this or not. But um... – Let's see. So the current state of it right now, the, the polar jet, you can see there's a you know, the subtropical jet down here to the south. The polar jet's mm -hmm. kind of taking a dip right now. But that's going to that's gonna shove off, and then you just get a lot of traffic from west to east. Nothing in particular, but, I mean, you look at that subtropical jet to the south. You know, it just keeps that westerly flow between the two jets really going out to sea. So there, there's not – nothing's really going to – I mean, like you mentioned earlier, Chris, in one of your posts, it's a Miller B set up. But it's not going to stick around. I mean, it, it's definitely a, you know, a, a landlocked system that that's going to be moving out very quickly, which is good. It's, it's, it's a good thing. So we don't want, we don't want anything to really cause any major blizzards or storms, ice storms for that. Yeah, that's right. I totally agree with that, Shay. 
Well, it has been a uh, been an active uh, December with rain and stuff like that. Um, transitioning though into uh, 2019, maybe it'll be a little bit drier. Uh, that was a really bad transition, but anyways, uh, <laughs> there is um, there's some news we want to bring you in, and we didn't do this before the show. And Evan, I'm sorry, but we did have Waffle House. I want to bring on our newest panelist. This is. Uh, Evan, he is joining us from, uh, well, Evan Fisher, you're from originally Asheville, but you're going to school in Charleston, at the College of Charleston, and uh, we just uh, really liked your work on, on social media, and we've been following you, and, and Jared, and, and Shay, and James, and myself, and, and Chris, we've all chatted back and forth, and we're like, we, we need to get this guy on our show, and uh, so we met with Evan, uh, was it last week, I guess, it was. via yeah. this chat, and we liked Evan so much, we were like, hey, come on and be a guest, and he was crazy enough to accept. So everyone, I want to welcome our newest panelist, Evan Fisher, to uh, to you all. So Evan, uh, give our folks a, a little background history about you. Yeah, so uh, thank you guys for having me. It's great to be on the show, uh, to have an opportunity. I understand that you know, Waffle House definitely takes precedence over introducing me. I wouldn't argue against that in uh, any situation. Um, but yeah, so I am originally from Charlotte, but I've spent the last five years in Asheville, uh, kind of fine-tuning my meteorology skills, you could say, uh, in the mountains and getting used to that area and all the different microclimates. But now that I'm going to school uh, down here in Charleston, I'm kind of adjusting that to the more coastal climate uh, and trying to figure out you know, what the heck is going on with forecasting down here. It's just a totally different game, so I'm really getting the whole the whole gamut from Western North Carolina to South, uh, Southeastern South Carolina and the coastal plains. So I'm just kind of all over the place, learning about the weather and enjoying it as I go. And Evan, uh, promote your social media, your Twitter especially, because you have some really great, great research. And we've also given Evan the keys to our social media. So you may see some posts from him as well. But uh, follow, if our followers want to uh, follow you, how can they do that? Yeah, so I'm on Twitter at Evan Fisher, uh, actually, yikes, E Fisher 828. Uh, so if you want to follow me there, I'm pretty much always posting stuff about the weather. Uh, right now, I'm really got kind of a lockdown with the, uh, the high winds that we've got going on in West North Carolina. And as that starts to move out and the snow moves out, I'm sure it'll transition to who knows what, whatever piques my interest. So. Well, Evan, we're happy to have you with us, and uh, as we were talking about 2019, we're bringing a lot of changes, so I want to bring in our executive producer, James Barton, and our associate executive producer, Jared Smith, and uh, you guys have been working feverishly over the holiday break, and uh, you've rolled out a pretty sweet package for us, so I'm going to hand it off to you guys and kind of let you talk about what's going to be new for this year. Scotty, thank you very much. I mean, I, I hope folks uh, enjoyed it during the, the hour. I think it's fairly self-explanatory, but we've done a facelift here in the new year. New logo, new graphics, trying to make the show as clean as possible, because I understand that is hip and cool. Right, Jared? We're going with clean. Oh, Jared? Is it I scotted it. I scotted it. Um, you know, yeah, I think a clean, crisp, cool, you know, just the... Uh, you know, just giving it, a, giving the old CWG a facelift. Not, not that CWG up in DC, the Carolina Weather Group CWG. <laughs> that's um, that's right. That that that's still a problem, and I don't think we're ever going to fix that. But, uh, but yeah, you know, it's uh, it, it's been fun to you know kind of uh, uplift this a bit. We've got a lot of really fun stuff uh, queued up for 2019. Expect some uh, big movement on our web presence here in the next few months. Uh, as we uh, we might be bringing the blog back, you know. Uh, uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna start up one Snapcasting for sure. Okay, yeah. okay. So we're gonna hold you to that. So, all right. So Shay is joining Snapchat. We're just uh, right now down here as we speak. Um, yeah. I'm gonna tell a quick story. So over Christmas, uh, my mother took the initiative to get me this wonderful gift of our Carolina Weather Group logo, and then she was horrified to find out that come Jan one we were launching a new logo. But mom, I'm still using it. The mug is still here, and it is now a collector's item. So, there you have it. Yeah. Scotty, I've got all these Carolina Weather Group uh, uh, business cards. Are going to have to remake, but no big deal. Thank you, James's mom. It's a great logo. Peter helped design that one, didn't he? It was it's a, it, and and we have tried to bring it forth. We have tried to. We've given it a little bit of an update. You know, there's not a lot of uh, fundamental changes. The fundamentals are strong. Just making a couple tweaks. No big deal. 
Yeah, and you'll see, especially during our uh, severe weather coverage, you'll see some new uh, new aspects and stuff. So we'll roll those out when that that warrants. Speaking of this week or next week, I will go ahead and, and, and tell you this: I'm not sure the next two weeks if we're going to have our guests or not because they are uh, unfortunately affected by the government shutdown. So. Uh, we are hoping that we can get on uh, with us next week, Dr. Ben uh, Murris. He uh, works for U uh, the USGS, and he's going to be talking about landslide threats in the Carolinas. And then the following week, we're supposed to have National Hurricane Center Director Ken Graham on for an interview. So uh, we are hoping, our fingers are crossed, that we're going to be able to uh, provide those interviews for you. If not, we will find some kind of content to cover. But uh, our next few weeks are going to be kind of tentative. As uh, we're going to have to see how the progress with the uh, the government shutdown is, and it's it's even affected in our weather podcast. So uh, we'll just uh, roll with it, and if, uh, if if we don't get our guests, we will definitely be able to rebook them once everything gets back going. But uh, just that's our tentative schedule for the next few weeks. We appreciate you watching tonight on the Carolina Weather Group. As always, you can join us every Wednesday night. Be sure to follow us on our Facebook and Twitter pages, and also on your uh, favorite. Um, app download or your uh, favorite podcast download uh stitcher and, and and google and all those places uh be sure to download our podcasts and share the word with uh your friends and family and we will see you back here again for another episode of the carolina weather group next wednesday evening have a great weekend and stay safe out there if you see any snow or ice